continuing our trend of going through games that I basically have no history with, we have Anachronox, or Anachronox, or Aorikronix. I, I kept having trouble pronouncing this word, even though they say it in the game. I don't know why. I think it's just because A's always trip me up just a little bit. You know what I mean? Anywho. <clears throat> so here we have this game. And uh, this was actually suggested by someone who knows who they are. And that person is probably sitting and thinking, oh, God, did he like it or not? Let me just go ahead and say I did like the game for the most part. Although if I was doing my usual review system, it probably would come out to be like a net neutral-ish on gameplay with several positives on the story side. This game has a weirdly large amount of behind-the-scenes material leading up to it, probably because of the fact that it was made in the wake of the destruction of Iron Storm uh, Dallas, I believe it was. And that makes sense, because Daikatana was an extremely well-publicized, absolute fiasco disaster of doom. That's actually probably one of the biggest reasons why I didn't pick this up, game up back in the day, was because you want me to pick up a game by the, the people who made Daikatana? You're nuts! Obviously, uh, I was mistaken about a great many things. But this was an interesting point in gaming history because, near as I could tell, this is kind of what was intended to be the last hurrah of these people. Now, obviously, most of these people, including Tom Hall himself, have gone on to do other things after this. But that's exactly what this feels like. All right, I want to do this game. And according to Hall himself, he's done a lot of interviews and behind-the-scenes stuff. He just had this idea for this world that he really wanted to make a thing. And, you know... Considering that this is the guy who brought us the Keen universe, I'm completely with him in general concept. So he's like, all right, I want to do this, and I want to do this, and we got to get this, and we need to make a JRPG, except in the Quake engine. Although they ended up using the, I believe, the id Tech 2 engine in the end there, rather than the Quake engine. But still, it shows. And that's one of the biggest complaints I tend to hear from people who play this game, is that it looks and feels and plays like an older game. In fact, this is going to sound like an insult, but I swear I don't mean it as one. This game, in many ways, plays like a fan mod of Quake 2. Or of Quake, if you prefer. Now, to explain what I mean by that a little bit, once upon a time, this is going to sound like a weird segue, but hear me out. Once upon a time, I was playing Unreal Tournament uh, 2003, I believe, specifically, with my friends. It was probably the biggest Unreal game for us, the biggest co-op, you know, competitive game for us. And we found a fan mod that added new levels, equipment, um... What, the ability to level up, the ability to allocate stats, special moves, basically turned Unreal Tournament 2003 into something of an RPG, which was very cool. We played the hell out of that. It was a fan mod. Now, I know you guys know what I mean by this, but I always find it hard to explain the specifics here. It's like they took something that was intended to be this and basically forced something that wasn't intended to be in here onto it. That's what I mean by fan mod. I mean, how many of you have played the Warcraft 3 MMO maps, to use another example, right? Like, it's it's clear, based on the presentation and the design of it, that the engine and the game were simply not designed to do this. We're just jury-rigging it to make it happen, right? That's what this game feels like in a lot of ways. And I never really got out of that feeling the entire way through. Now, I'm not saying that's necessarily a bad thing, but it does mean the whole game feels just a little bit off throughout the course of it. And it was, a, it was a, like I said, it was a constant presence. Probably the biggest thing for me is the fact that it looks like they actually use the old menu system, as in, like, if you'd hit escape to, to change the audio volume or whatever, as the method of doing dialogue boxes, which just never, never stopped feeling weird to me. I also want to mention something uh, before I go on. I was I usually do a little bit of research on the behind the scenes, but this time I was in such a rush, I basically just fired up the game and started going. So I'm like, going, 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 going. And after like the, the point at which I had left the first planet and was actually leaving Sunder after it was destroyed, I'm like, hang on a second. That music sounds familiar. Turns out, Ron Jones did some of the music for this game, which I didn't know walking into it. It was just... I know that composer because, you know, after a while, especially after a while of studying music, you get to learn the, the, the fingerprints of certain composers and their music. But anyways, so um, another thing I want to give weird comments on is the camera. It was one of the first things I noticed and one of my earliest biggest problems with the game is the fact that the camera is a little bit too... Whoa, you know what I mean? Or maybe you don't, but there's a lot of sections where 
rather than like having a panning shot down a hallway, it would be like a. The camera just kind of goes all over the place, and it does this throughout the entirety of the game during pre you know pre designed cut scenes as well as during actual gameplay. Just very strange. Now, before I talk about anything else, I want to talk about what I mentioned earlier. This feels like a passion project. Now, a lot of that's coming off of interviews from people who made this, including Hall himself. But everything I've heard and read about this game is that this was a group of people who are like, all right, we're on our way out. You know, we know that Eidos, or Eidos, I've heard it pronounced both ways, is shutting us down. We know that this, this studio's on the way out. We know that they're not really going to be able to do much with this. We know Daikatana was horribly received. Let's make a game. Let's make a JRPG, like, except in the Quake engine. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. And they made this game. To be clear, I do think this is definitely a net positive game. In fact, I would recommend this for anybody who hasn't played this because it was fun. But it very much feels like they just sat down and like, all right, let's just make this happen. Despite the fact that this is not going to be this financial move of doom from our careers. And did it. Now, details kind of vary. I've noticed that some people disagree on the exact accounting, but all of, all accounts agree that they got this game done and shipped within days, one direction or another, of the studio being formally shut down. Now, that by itself kind of sucks. As I mentioned earlier, Hall kind of had this whole idea going forward. This is always supposed to be part one. Part one of three, in fact. And we're probably never going to get part two or three. And that sucks, because I would really like to see where they go with this. I hate to spoil this, but given that I just recommended this game, I do have to add an addendum. This game basically ends on a cliffhanger, which makes it the second game that I've reviewed for, for this cycle, uh, or really, that's the wrong word, for second one I've ruminated on for this cycle that ends on a cliffhanger and will probably never be continued. We're just continuing those trends today. Anyways, I'm getting off topic. The combat itself is serviceable. It, it really does feel like, like I said, they grafted JRPG combat onto it. Many, many, many references to Chrono Trigger are made by everyone who made on this game. And it shows! This feels a lot like Chrono Trigger, except done in the Quake engine. I, I know it's not the Quake engine, but you get the point. Because it's like, okay, so everyone has their ATB. Once it's full, you can pick their options. It's basically in the wait mode, for the most part. And you've got your HP, you've got your... Uh, I wrote it down. It's the NRG. Uh, neutron radiated glodens. That's what that means. And then you've got the bogue. And the the second the second thing is basically your your special attacks and, and abilities. And the third one is your plot abilities, which you get as the story progresses. I like the usage of Mistech, although I feel like with a few tinkerings, Mistech could be a great system rather than merely a good system. Because as is, it functionally means that you should always put your ice Mistech on uh, Sly, and you should always advance him down that path, etc. Because that's just his element. That's what he's good at. You know, like Marl back in Chrono Trigger. She's the ice person, right? Um, but I didn't mind it at all. And indeed, like I said, I did enjoy it. It's just, after a certain point, you kind of just kind of get into a groove of this is what I'm going to do every turn. Like Chrono Trigger. <laughs> um... I also like the, this is this tiny little thing that I very much enjoy. And I didn't actually pick up on this at first, I'll be completely honest. But I like how a lot of the mistechs can do different things depending on target. For example, if you have poison, just a really simple thing, you can poison an enemy, or you can cure poison on yourself. It's not two separate spells, it's just the it impact of poison. So it's either the positive impact by removing it, or the negative impact by adding it. Make sense? It's a kind of a neat little system, and I kind of enjoy uh, the, the, the the usage of that. <sighs> Sorry, they're doing construction. There's nothing I can do about that. Let's talk about the game itself. So, first of all, we have Fatima, who is the first person I want to talk about. I do kind of like the, the usage of Fatima. She's basically a Navi character, except a little bit more fleshed out and a little bit more human, which is funny because she's dead. But I, I like her because she's the summary character. What's going on in the story right now? Where am I at? What am I supposed to do? And, of course, she kind of serves as a pseudo-tutorial. She also allows you to uh, figure out that you need to go talk to the Time Minders. And the whole thing about the Time Minders being cosmically connected to every universe simultaneously. They give you good luck. 
makes perfect sense in lore because every time you restore a save and actually go forward, then that's the timeline in which you succeeded. Therefore, it was good luck to touch the time minder. Anyways, <clears throat> I like that. I like that. Uh, I do like... Oh, God. See, the problem is I don't have a lot of specifics to say about this. This is a... Let, let's talk about this. This is a lighthearted game. Now, I've talked about this concept before. There's a difference between a parody game like, say, uh, you know, the game I just covered a few months ago. I can't think of the name of... Uh, Monkey Island, The Secret of Monkey Island, right? That's a parody game. That's a game where the game is intended to be a comedic work, which, which parodies the works it's, it's functioning on, and tells jokes all the time. This game is more of a light-toned game. Still technically comedic, but it's not actually a comedic work. What is it happening is intended to be taken seriously. These are actual stories and actual events that have actual impact. And that's the difference. A comedic game, a truly comedic game, a parody game, doesn't. Like, a parody game is just joke, 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 and the plot itself is usually in service of the jokes rather than the other way around. To use a direct parallel, this game reminded me of the Paper Mario series, or indeed the Mario RPGs in general, which are serious games that have actual storylines and awesome plots and character development, all those good things that are in RPGs, but they are very lighthearted and comedic in overall tone. Again, not just telling jokes over and over, but kind of presenting it in that sort of a light. It's, it's hard to explain if you haven't actually seen it, but I hope you at least partially understand what I'm talking about. Now, I also want to mention in addendum to this that mo for the first several like hours of gameplay, I didn't smile like barely at all, and I didn't laugh once. The first time, the first thing that got anything out of me was the sock, mostly just because of the way they presented it. This, this now sock can be yours for the low, low price. And, you know, that whole thing got a chuckle out of me. But it wasn't until later in the game that the game actually started to really start, you know, amusing me on a regular basis. And the funny part is it's almost entirely on the power of the director. See, a lot of the directing in this game is surprisingly good. And that's the next thing I want to talk about. And when I say directing, I want to stress specifically the usage of camera angle, as wobbliness aside, the direction you're, uh, that scenes follow. It's, it's hard to explain directing, I just realized, if you don't know what I'm talking about. Let me use a direct example rather than trying to meander here. There's a scene where in order to show the passage of time, the camera is on Sly. And he kind of looks to the right, and then he looks to the left, and looks to the right. Each time he changes his angle, his head covers the screen for a second, and then when he comes out of it, and when his head is no longer covering the screen, what he's looking at has changed. This is showing the passage of time. So in other words, you know, he's over here, and there's a bunch of books, and there's a whole bunch of books. That's the way they're presenting it. And I like that. I like the, this idea, and I like this usage of clever... Uh, it's, it's just clever. The whole, the whole directorial style is clever. Um, another one I really enjoyed was Sarah's interrogation slash investigation, which is actually a flashback far further on to the game, where it's like, hey, what are you talking about? Well, uh, you don't know this. You should talk to this guy. You should talk to this guy. And each, each line is being said by a different person in basically the same position, except it's a different entity each time, as it's just bam, 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 getting through the, the dialogue very quickly and efficiently. There's a lot of very smart directing throughout the whole work. And that makes sense because apparently Hall reached out to an actual film director who was an indie film director at the time and said hey could you help me set this up and the results show I know this is a weird thing to comment on but I'd say the directing overall was probably one of my favorite elements of the game I also like how quite a few <laughs> of the early bits of the game are uh, it's just kind of there and a lot of weird stuff happens that you're, both, you're basically just supposed to take in stride this leads me to the next thing I want to comment on. I mentioned the comedic tone thing. Well, how many of you people have ever heard of Douglas Adams? Now, I'm going to go ahead and admit something that's going to make the universe hate me, but it is my job to be honest with you guys. I don't actually like Douglas Adams' style that much. I'm not saying he's a bad writer. Quite the contrary. He's actually a very good writer. And he certainly knows how to construct his stories and his com comedy very well. It's just not my form of comedy for the most part. He leans a little bit too heavy on something that I just don't have a proper way of describing. I, I literally nowadays just take it as the Douglas Adams style, right? It's a very unique blend of the absurd combined with the totally mundane. And it's something he's very good at. 
there was a lot of that in this. There's a lot of just, hey, and here's this weird tentacle thing, which is interacting with this in this way that is completely normal, even though it's utterly ludicrous. What's funny is, near as I can tell, none of the writers or creators or Hall himself said anything about being inspired by Douglas Adams. So maybe that's just me and my impression, but I got that feel throughout pretty much the entirety of the work. So then they get to Sunder, and we get to probably the first joke that really made me laugh. The Bouncer. Because this is Sunder, planet of geniuses, all the super smartest people in the entire universe, all in one place. So in order to get into the club, you need to be able to answer a bouncer question. <laughs> this also serves as a tutorial for the minigame system, which actually I kind of liked, if I'm being honest. I like the inclusion of plot abilities, for lack of a better way to put it, right? Like, a lot of games have done this kind of a thing, where you have some kind of ability that's deliberately designed not to be used in combat that helps you solve problems. Uh, Octopath Traveler had the interactions with NPCs. Uh, Final Fantasy Mystic Quest had the different weapons you could use in the overall to solve puzzles. You know, I could come up with other examples that are better than those two. But you get the idea. So I like that, and I like that inclusion. I also happen to like Pal in general, by the way, although I have the least to say about him, but we'll move on from him for just a second. Because first... We have to talk about how Sunder is then destroyed, and it's just, whoa. And that is, then follows the next scene, which made me laugh a lot harder. What are we going to do? Oh, we're going to have to try not to go insane. Day one. All right, this isn't bad. Day two. Da -da 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 -da. Day three. Okay, is it is it is it in the, the Decoria system? No, he said it wasn't in the system. Ha, you guys thought you were smart. It's actually an Acronox. What? But you said it starts with a U. Yeah, an Acronox. Day four. You know, just... <laughs> Pick up your socks. Day five. And then Pal's doing a little song and dance. Day 17. You know. <laughs> the... <laughs> I'm sorry. That was a good shtick. That was a good shtick as they just follow through, just absolutely rapid fire through almost three weeks of time as they are stranded in their ship with nowhere to go. And then they land on this random planet... And I'm sure it will never matter again. It's called Democritus. <laughs> okay, yeah, Democritus got me too. The best part, I mentioned the directing. I noticed that from about this-ish time to the end of the game, the directing style changed notably. Early on, it felt like they were trying to do something, for lack of a better way to put it, more straight. Now, what I mean by that... This is going to sound like a weird parallel, but I swear I'm going somewhere with this. How many of you guys have ever seen Scooby-Doo? Now, Scooby-Doo actually has a very unique directing style to it, which is something that's been utilized by many other people over the years, mostly for cartoons. That style basically boils down to something that indicates something, but isn't really physically possible. The most obvious example of this is any time you see, like, all of the, the gang just kind of lean over from a, you know, from, from a doorway and look out, think about that logistically for a second. Actually think about what it would take for all of them to just go... As they're leaning out the doorway and, look, and peering around. Because it's not actually all that physically feasible to do. Not unless you've got some really specific setup. That's what I mean by the Scooby-Doo style. It's not intended to be literally possible. It's more intended to be metaphorically possible. It's indicative of them peeking around the corner. Make sense? Rather than they're literally doing this weird bendy thing that, that would defy physics. And I noticed a lot more of that. Probably one of the most obvious examples for me actually has to do with the, the democratic sins. Because there's this point where they're on the villain's ship and they're about to be ejected into space. And they're like, okay, what do I do? And then, like, the camera is right here looking straight up. So imagine you're the camera and you're looking straight up at me and I'm the sky. And this one guy just kind of pops in and is like, what should we do? Should we do this? And then all of them just come in simultaneously, yes! <laughs> You know, that kind of thing. That isn't really how physics works. That's not how blocking works. Let me put this to you in a different way. A lot of the blocking and directing and animation of the characters wouldn't work if these were live action. It just wouldn't. Not unless you had pulleys and, and strings and... and uh, uh, I can't actually think of the name of the thing right now. God. The things that allow you to basically hover in the air while making poses. I, there's a term for that. And... Uh, but instead, it makes perfect sense if you're basically watching a cartoon. And since this is done in the engine, which is not designed to be realistic, that works. Now, I think this is a deliberate change and course correction throughout the course of the game. I hate to segue again for a second here. But as I was reading the behind-the-scenes stuff, I noticed that originally they were going to do what most other games were doing at this point in time. 
But Hall himself was very adamant against that. The cutscenes shouldn't defeat the game, I believe is a direct quote there. Referring to how you can always tell a really big jump in difference, graphically speaking, between the gameplay, you know, the actual functional gameplay, and the cutscenes. Nowadays, there's actually three layers of this, because nowadays we have gameplay, in-game engine cutscenes, and then what I usually refer to as pre-rendered cutscenes. In other words, a pre-rendered cutscene is something where you hit play on a file. It has nothing to do with the game itself. An in-engine cutscene is where a series of scripts happen to make things happen. It's all very crafted and very scripted, but it is still being done with the in-game engine. And then, of course, there's stuff that's just in the game, which is the furthest down from all three of these. Um, a lot of MMOs use all three of these uh, combinations, for example, nowadays. But most games in general use some combination of these three uh, elements in order to present their, their various cutscenes. Remember back in the day when there was just one type of cutscene in games? <laughs> Anyways, so the intent by Hall and by the director in general was to not do that, to not have the cutscenes be pre-rendered or done in something else. So instead, all of it is the second type of thing, in-engine rendering, fully scripted, which I usually refer to as an in-engine cutscene. And it works very well, I think, because it adds, it, first of all, it keeps you in the game. Second of all, it kind of adds to the aesthetic. One of the things I've talked about many, many, many times is that whether or not an art, uh, the specific art or graphics of a game ages well, usually has more to do with the style and approach and usage of the art, in other words, the art direction, than it does the specific fidelity of the art. This is why I also try to dif differentiate between quality and fidelity. Fidelity is usually making things look more realistic. You know, Uncharted 4 was an extremely high fidelity game. Whereas, by contrast, Zelda Wind Waker was a very high-quality game, both in terms of graphics, again, to be more specific. Wind Waker, of course, looks absolutely nothing like real life, whereas Uncharted 4 looks a whole lot like real life and is very well-crafted and blah, 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 blah. So you get the point. I think the idea to go with quality in this case and basically make this look like a cartoon was the correct choice. It means it's aged better, first and foremost, but also it means that its style isn't just limited to the textures and the models, but instead the way they are used, the art direction, which goes back to what I was just talking about. Anyway, so they get to Democritus, and de I cannot say enough good things about this planet. It's a planet of pure democracy, where they're all just like, okay, so there's this hive swarm of death coming to kill us. Well, maybe they're putting ha gift baskets, right? I mean, that makes sense. And so they decide to go ahead and stop the hive swarm, and there's basically like a little mini level when we go do that. We go back, and it's like, hey, thanks. Yeah, okay. There's this nice bit. <laughs> oh, I thought I wrote it down. Looks like I did not, actually. Although there is this nice bit where, uh, in order to go get the ship, Pal just says, no, I can't let you do this. And uh, uh, Ro, I think, just walks up and is like, huh. Okay, congratulations, your robot just became self-aware. You're a father now! <laughs> and something about just, again, the, the mundane absurdity of that. I mean, droid effect is a very, very, very common fictional concept, probably because, as I've said before, it has its roots in real-life humanity. And so the idea that droid effect happened with Pal here, just on the spot, basically, is just, oh, well, he's sentient now. Congratulations, now you have to treat him like a person. He's like, okay, why don't you stay here? We'll, we'll deal with this later. Although Pal was one of my favorite party members, by the way. So they go ahead and they... Uh, they, they they go defeat the hive and they come back and Democritus is like all right yes together we shall we shall give them <laughs> we shall give them a party and then one person walks up uh, do these hors d'oeuvres really represent the the Democritus people oh no we should maybe we should do something else for them maybe we should do uh, like a parade ooh let's vote on it and then Rose is just like can can we leave. <laughs> But what I love most about Democritus is the thing that everyone loves about Democritus. The fact that they're a party member. The fact that the planet just decides to shrink down and join your party. That is an extremely Douglas Adams thing to do. And is pretty funny. And it generally also makes Democritus my, overall probably my favorite party member. I'll just go ahead and admit that because, duh. <laughs> I, I was one of those situations where I kind of forced the character to be in my party all the time simply because I liked the character, not because they were good in combat or anything like that. So Democritus just kind of shows up, 
and and then the game does this big long striptease scene where they introduce Sarah, who then ends the scene with assassinating people. I was gonna make fun of that, but as I thought about it, it's actually a good bit of very quick and dirty exposition. This is a woman who uses her appearance, which is good, as a method by which to infiltrate people and then kill them. Yep, okay, I get it. <laughs> That's all I really need to know. Although we do, of course, get more of her backstory as we go on. This is when the main plot comes in. I've got to talk about the main plot. So, <sighs> let's talk about time travel seclusion which is something that I almost never get to talk about. It's a very rarely used concept when it comes to time travel. Um, the idea is this. Let me use a weird example, a completely made-up example. I want you to picture for a moment that you're from the year 15. Just bear me out. We're making up numbers here. So you're, you're, you're from the year 15. Now you want to jump... Now you decide to jump forward in time to the year 30. And you find out that in the year 20... The whole world is devastated and all life on it is basically brought down to zero. Now, you go back trying to do anything, whatever you can, to fix this, but this event that caused this was externally caused. Like, let's say it was the sun expanding or something. So you don't have the technology or the power to do anything about the sun expanding. What that means is, even though you can alter time constantly and nonstop and completely and thoroughly change history, all of those changes stop mattering once the board is reset. That's the seclusion element of time travel. In other words, it, it refers to a specific type of event that is so changing or sweeping that all changes to the timeline prior to or after don't matter because it's, it's a reset button, basically. Now, I mention that because in this game, that's exactly the type of time travel they use. They posit the idea that the very nature of the Big Bang and the Big Crunch are seclusion events. In other words, if you are in Universe 3 in the future, which, remember, is not a separate universe. It's still this universe. It's just a remade universe from the matter of this one, you know, millions of years in the future, right? So if you are in the future and you are in Universe 3 and you send people back to Universe 2, within reason, that doesn't matter. Like, you are altering history, but on such a scale that it doesn't matter because your history will still be unaltered because of the seclusion event. You with me so far? This is the one and only way that the order, you know, orders, uh, decisions actually make any kind of sense. Unfortunately, there's another science fiction concept, which I don't have a proper term for, but it basically boils down to mastery. You know, the, the, the higher tech you are, the more mastery you have over everything. That's why I just call it mastery. And so we find out that Chaos and the Dark Servants have a sufficient mastery to have a way to actually be able to impact the Third Universe. Oh, God, excuse me. By reducing and subtracting the amount of matter within the universe, they will be able to alter the speed by which the Great Bang, Big Bang and the Big Crunch happen until they get to the point where they can affect it on a grand scale. Now, there's a lot of things physics-wise that's wrong with this idea. First and foremost, the fact that they haven't actually removed any matter from the universe because of the nature of what destruction is. Second of all, because of the fact that if you just removed all, you know, it shoved all the matter out so that the universe kept going on forever, it would just keep expanding forever. It would never keep going in. At a certain point, it would stop being tenable as an existence. And it's worth noting a lot of this is debatable and speculative in real life, too. So, whatever. But I wanted to comment on that time travel element because it was one of the most interesting things about the plot to me. The fact that they're using a seclusion event to basically say, yeah, we can do time travel however we want. By all accounts, this is typical type 2 time travel. And yes, this is the second. You can tell I lined these games up this way on purpose. This is the second game we've been covering here that has a, a specific type of time travel. The problem is we have to only speculate that it's type 2 time travel because we it's definitely not type 1. Type 3 is possible, but there's nothing to indicate for or against, so who knows. And for anybody curious, yes, my time travel stuff's going to be on the website by now. I swear I'm going to get that done in the future before you see this video. I haven't done it as of this very moment. So, I'm looking at my notes here. We go to the, we go to the church. <laughs> You're under arrest. What? Yes, you have trespassed. However... If you want to do this favor for us, it's like, if you just wanted me to do a side quest, dude, just ask me. And, of course, he actually asks you to do three separate side quests. And it's like, okay, fine, I've done your side quest here. <laughs> can I can continue the thing? And then we go talk to the Grand Mysterium. This is another example of excellent directing. 
I know that I keep banging on about it, but there's this great scene where it's actually two scenes that have been mashed together. One is the scene of Sly talking to the Grand Mysterium, who is expositing the plot, as I just said to you. The other is the rest of the team listening to Sly recounting the history and, and the plot, as the Grand Mysterium said to him. And the, and the camera cuts back and forth between the two repeatedly, to it gets to the point where, for example, one of the characters will ask a question, and then the Grand Mysterium will answer. And then he'll mention something, and then they'll mention something, and it just kind of goes back and forth very smoothly. Wonderfully edited, wonderfully directed. And of course, and you, of course, Sly, are the best person in the universe. Anyways. <laughs> so... And, of course, there's a lot of brick jokes in this. Like, uh, the Grand Mr. he told me his name, but I don't remember how to pronounce it. Then the game just gets into the absolutely ludicrous part. Now, I know this is the weirdest time I've ever said a spoiler warning, but let me just stress spoiler warning. Because this is, this is not a spoiler in the sense that it was his sled. This is a spoiler in the sense that if you know it's coming, it will not have the same impact. So if you plan on playing this game, this is officially your moment to go play the game. So then we enter a comic book, and it even does the thing where the panels show up. <laughs> Meanwhile, pulling the attention away from his new infiltrators, the great destructor, I can't even remember his name, is, is preparing with his team of, of total villainy, and I just, I dissolved. I lost it. This, this, I, I, this game in general had been funny, but the whole comic book session was the part where I just dissolved into total laughter. And by the way, I was not spoiled on it. I didn't know it was coming. And then, so we get to that whole thing, it's like, okay, well, now let's go ahead and fight the guy. Okay, that was easy. And then all of a sudden, the panel shows up again. But then, Sly realized what happened in the previous issue. And there's even, like, the editor's notes over the comic book stuff. And what's funniest is this kind of thing is actually really easy to do, if you think about it, because all they had to do is design the actual comic book uh, outlines as a, a, an actual object in the game, which they then shoved in between the camera and what they're looking at. So effectively, you're looking through the window of the panel at the actual render behind it. It's it's good. It's really good. It's it's brilliantly done and extremely smart and awesome. And then we have the boss fight. We meet Paco for the first time. He's kind of a late joiner of the party. And, <laughs> well, then we all die, or we, we almost die. And then Democritus expands with the scene I mentioned earlier. Now, this is interesting because what happens next is basically the breather section. It's a very common thing to do in fiction, have a moment where everything just kind of goes on the down low bit. And I noticed in the breather section, we get a lot of past exposition. This is when we learn about the truth about what happened with Sly, Fatima, and Sarah. Uh, well, most of the truth. There's still one little twist left in there. It's good stuff. It, I also like how they show us bits and pieces of the sequence of events from all three characters' perspectives. We learn about how Sarah was progressing through the investigation and was eventually kidnapped. We learn about how Fatima was about to finally quit her job and then decided to go with him and ended up dying. And we learn how Sly was the one responsible for killing Fatima. Now, all of that's all we learn in this section. We also get a little bit of a, this stuff with Paco where he helps a young girl and decides to help the beam. That's all good stuff. And, of course, the De Democritians are awesome throughout this whole section. You know, the whole planet's watching. But then we get to the part where we actually have to go after Detta again. Now, I haven't said much about him because there's not much to say. He is a typical, what I like to call an Act 1 villain. Um, in other words, he is the person who seems like a big bad, but ultimately isn't. He's, he's low tier compared to what's really going on. You know, the idea of... I'm trying to think of probably the most typical example I can off the top of my head in a well-known game, because... <laughs> A lot of games like to use introduce the main villain early on and then have that be the main villain the whole time. I suppose Final Fantasy Tactics would be the best example, but I imagine a lot of you haven't played that. So let me just say that it's a thing. <laughs> Moving on. I'm sure there's better examples I can't think of right now. So Dead is basically just the Act 1 villain. He is the, um, the guy who you knew as a kid, but then I got a lot of money and now I'm getting even bigger. And of course there's the scene where we finally learn the final bit of exposition that he was the one who... Sly, who legitimately did obviously care about Fatima, put himself basically in life debt, in servitude to Detta in order to be able to save Fatima's life and get her into the life cursor. By the way, nice thing, making her the literal cursor. cursor. Zelda's actually done that before with fairies. Uh, Phantom Hourglass comes to mind immediately. So then we get to the bit where it's like we go... <laughs> we go and see the planet of the... Oh, I can't remember what they're called. The aliens... And he's like, ah, you will die! Wait, wait, no, I, m I met with your leader, the Grand Mysterium. Oh, okay. 
Tell us his name. Your life depends upon it. I I don't remember it. I thought about writing it down, but no. (laughs) And he just says it perfectly, and they're like, oh my god, he's telling the truth. We get a lot more exposition on the specifics of what's happening here, the nature of the Dark Servants, and how they're trying to destroy stuff in order to send the... uh, the Chaos Dudes even further back in order to prevent the future ex- universe from ever happening. Blah, 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 blah. We also learned that the uh, the Mistech is actually stuff sent back from the future universe that has to be activated by universal con- you know, interactions in order to be a weapon that we can use against them if we need to. So we find out why Mistech is such an advantage and why we are so empowered by it. It's actually something I like when video games do, when they give an in-lore, in-game reason for why it is that the main characters are so damn strong right? Otherwise, it's just kind of weird when someone is just able to mow their way through hundreds and hundreds of enemies. I mean, that's logical, right? Otherwise, you're just typical action dude number 57. Anyways, so then they go and they find the bar owner from the beginning of the freaking game. And my favorite part is, is like, it's treated like this big reveal. But as the bar owner actually says, it's like, I tried to give you this quest like a month ago. <laughs> I actually asked you to go get this stupid thing. And I'm just sitting here like, God damn it, Sly. Anyways, then we you know, we go through the first dungeon in the game again to go get the damn thing again after we have dealt with Detta. I kind of skipped ahead a little bit there. So we deal with Detta. Detta's dead. Woo. And then we move on. It's like, all right, time to save the universe. Let's go get this stupid thing. Turns out Grumpos was one of the bad guys all along. I got to admit, I did not call that. I, I Maybe I just missed it, but I didn't see any indicators of that whatsoever. He was just a dude who was trying to get this stuff and also was very interested in becoming rich off of it. And then, oh, yeah, sorry, got to do this. Bye. <laughs> so then we go fight the final boss. I, uh, I, don't even, I don't even know what to say about that. And then, all right, let's go save the universe. Dun, 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 dun. To be continued, never. As I said before, the biggest flaw in this game by far, to me, is the fact that it ended on a to-be-continued, which probably never will. There's always THQ Nordic, the ever the ever popular uh, you know company that saves old IPs. But at this point in time, I'm not even sure how much of the original crew is still A, available, and B, interested in doing something like this. Does Hall even still have his original you know 350-page uh, document discussing this game and how it works? I would love to see a sequel for this personally, as long as it was good, obviously, to see what would happen next. But of course, we've also had plenty of sequels where we find out what happens next, and it's not really a good sequel. So I, I suppose I don't know what I want at this point. This was still actually a treat to go through. I did enjoy it. And I hope you guys have enjoyed my thoughts. I'll see you next time. <laughs>